I'm going to allow each panelist to introduce themselves before kicking off the questions. Eric, would you mind starting us off? Sure. Is this on? Okay. So, as Elise mentioned, Eric Shea with the U.S. Department of F Energy. I work at the Office of Electricity, um, which has a which where I lead their energy storage division. Um, it represents eighty to one hundred million dollars in annual R and D spending, everything from basic materials research to deployment and technical assistance. Um, we have a couple programs active right now that are relevant to this conversation. One is Energy Storage for Social Equity, where we're helping over a dozen communities um, chart their own energy future, including energy storage. Um, I'll also mention that my office uses extensive use of the Small Business and Innovation Research Program, um, where we help new innovators um, develop new technologies, and my office is consistently in the top rankings in the department for first-time women-owned and minority-owned businesses as recipients. Um, one of the other things I help the department do is coordinate energy storage activities with all the other offices um, as part of the energy storage grant challenge. So looking forward to that conversation. All right, my name is Gregor Shuny. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, so I'm the executive director of the Aspen Institute's Energy and Environment Program, and I've been with Aspen for the last seven years, and before that, I was uh, in the White House in the Department of Energy, um, most recently as the Chief of Staff for Energy Policy uh, in the Obama administration. My program at the Aspen Institute works um, to, with people, organizations, and governments to take greater action on solving climate change. And so we tend to look at the things that are the, road, the roadblocks to um, decarbonizing, building resilience and adaptation, um, and that includes things like uh, critical minerals policy, um, permitting and siting, how do we build things, how do we get to the state of decarbonization that we need to get to. Um, and so storage is one of those areas that's an enabler um, of a decarbonized grid. And then as we electrify other sectors, um, you know, is, is one of the things that's going to allow that to happen. So I'm really excited for this conversation. No. My name is Jeff Bishop. I'm a co-founder and CEO of Key Capture Energy. We develop, construct, own, and operate standalone energy storage projects across the U.S. Uh, we have about 500 megawatts uh, currently in late stage construction or in operations, and uh, look to be expanding that out rapidly uh, over the next few years. Uh, if folks are looking for job opportunities in Houston or in New York, we, we are hiring. <laughs> um, uh, Trey from my team is here, so um, <laughs> if, if you are looking for opportunities, um, make sure to meet up with him today. Good morning, everyone. My name is Melissa Alfano. I am the Director of Energy Markets and Council for the Solar Energy, Solar Energy Industries Association. So at SIA, we represent the solar and storage industry as we seek to um, make policies across the U.S. that encourage the development of solar and storage, both at the wholesale and the distribution level. Um, SIA, particularly, we have um, a lot of programs that are really focusing on environmental justice and energy communities, seeking to ensure that our energy transition is a just and equitable one. So I look, really look forward to the conversation here today. Great, thank you. So let's get started with the questions. So experts have stated that energy storage is the foundation for a decarbonized, resilient, and affordable grid, as well as a game changer in strengthening electric grid. What are some of the, some of the innovative storage technologies that will transform the grid? Okay, so I can I can start. Um, DOE um, over the past twenty years has supported over thirty different kinds of energy storage technologies, depending on how you count them. So. Big families of technologies include electrochemical, so anything battery related. Um, everything from things that look like your typical double A cell to large vats of chemicals that can be pumped um, in either direction to charge or discharge. And there's gravitational systems like um, mechanical systems that lift and lower weights, or modular pump hydro systems that sort of put the power of a dam into sort of a small, um, stackable solution. And there's thermal systems um, and other kinds of chemical systems. Um, DOE has a goal uh, called the Long Duration Storage Earth Shot, where we're looking to reduce the cost of energy storage by 90% by the end of the decade. Um, I personally think that there's at least a half, half a dozen of those technologies that have a shot at making that goal. And part of the excitement of being 
in this field at this time is watching this horse race among all these different technologies um, being refined, being tested, being demonstrated. Um, I don't have the answer of like which one will get there first, but one of them will get there at least. Just to uh, build off of that, I mean, I think there's a lot of potential um, battery storage options. I think, you know, Iron Air is one of those, but there's, a, you know, at least half a dozen others that um, are uh, kind of on their way. I mean, I think in terms of innovation, you know, the low, the, the price coming down um, on especially lithium ion and, and other technologies is going to be one of the key things that's going to unlock, uh, unlock the technology for more and more people. Um, you know, if you if you contact a solar company today, that you know the assumption is that you're going to get battery storage along with that rooftop solar, and so I think that was that was not the case just a few years ago, um, and so that's becoming more and more of a, a common theme. I think some of the other things, though, is you know um, being able to integrate EVs and uh, into the grid um, to be able to charge and discharge um, to help balance things out. And then the longer duration storage, things like hydrogen, things like uh, pumped hydro in certain parts of the country are going to be really important, um, you know, add, to, to address seasonality and uh, other issues like that. Um, I just want to add that there's like, in addition to the technological innovation, I think we need to look at markets innovation because that's just what I do. I follow the money. I don't, <laughs> right? Um, so one of the things to look at is both on the wholesale level when you're looking at the major markets like MISO, PJM, SPP, um, looking at how they are structuring their markets to encourage the development of, so of storage, and then looking at other mechanisms like, um, for instance, FERC Order 2222, if those of you are familiar with that, the integration of distributed storage and solar into the grid. So looking at how do we went adjust the markets and the mechanisms that we live in to account for these new technologies. Yeah, and then just from a very macro level, um, in the U.S., we're, we're not going to be building another new coal plant, and they'll continue to retire. Uh, thermal plants were often built in the 50s and 60s um, in urban areas where they never should have been built, but uh, we still need some capacity there. And uh, as we get more wind and more solar online, there does need to be something to fill in that capacity gap for uh, when the sun's not shining and the wind's not blowing. So uh, I, right now, lithium-ion is, is a clear winner today. Uh, five years from now, it probably won't be. Um, there will probably be a whole bunch of new winners, whether that be hydrogen or different chemistries on the battery side. Uh, aggregating electric vehicles, distributed energy resources. Um, there will probably be a lot of winners, but uh, you know the transition is happening very quickly, and uh, regulation and markets um, haven't quite caught up yet. So it's, it's going to be an interesting few years. That's very true. Thank you. So often communities of color are left <coughs> behind when innovation is taking place in the energy sector. How can the energy industry and the federal government ensure that innovative storage technologies extend to all communities? I'll jump in first. So um, one thing that uh, you know, both at the federal level and on the state level is to uh, force a lot of things to happen. And so in the Inflation Reduction Act, for instance, uh, you do get a uh, added kicker for uh, the tax credit um, you know, if you build on a, uh, on a brownfield site where, you know, there used to be a thermal plant in a community that um, it shouldn't have been built there. And so, um, you know, so we, we need the carrot in order to go there. Um, and then at the state level, like, you know, we work a lot in New York and, uh, you know, we have lots of conversations with the state agencies of, uh, y'all need to start mandating uh, certain percentages of spent. Um, because, uh, you know, like we do it voluntarily where we, um, you know, demand that our uh, suppliers have a certain amount of spent uh, by women-owned businesses, minority-owned businesses, veteran-owned businesses, but let, let's, let's start to mandate that. And so, um, you know, from a very high level, um, you know, putting in the carrots and the sticks um, in order to actually have uh, you know, people uh, do the right thing, um, you know, it's pretty easy. 
see if I can just jump in. And you mentioned carrots and sticks, and if we're going to stick with analogies, how about opening doors? Um, so on the wholesale level, one of the biggest problems is interconnection queue backlogs. Um, and we have this huge problem that is coming, and it is coming, of a lot of thermal retiring and a lot of solar and wind coming online. Storage is further back in the queue because of the cost. We need innovative policy solutions at the interconnection level to get those storage solutions online before everything else. Um, you know, do it in a way that respects investments and everything like that, but recognizing that you need the storage to replace the thermal. Um, I completely agree with the, um, the markets and policy pieces that Jeff and Melissa have talked about. I want to highlight what can be done to make storage more accessible from a technological point of view. Um, so from, uh, for, for decades and decades, the way you got to lower cost on the utility scale system was to build larger and larger thermal plants. Like you got economies of scale from building larger things. Um, what storage opens up is you don't get economies of scale from the building of the object of the device. You get economies of scale from manufacturing the same device over and over. Right? So, can we design devices that um, are reliable um, and operational at a smaller scale, so that um, a house or a church or a, a, a school can afford one of these things if it's right, if it is right for them? There's one of them open right now on innovative methods for storage deployment. Um, and that is um, open until early January, I believe. So, want more information about that? I'm, I'm sure the program manager. I'm happy to connect with him. <laughs> Just to kind of uh, wrap things up, I think the the carrots and sticks, um, as well as the opening doors, makes a lot of sense. I think in the Inflation Reduction Act, because of the way the tax credits are structured, it doesn't apply to a lot of people, and so I think we still need to find additional financing mechanisms to um, to enable deployment, um, and especially in communities of color. I think the Brownfield um, uh, comment is also good because the, the building storage facilities in former coal plants is an easy way to avoid a lot of the transmission issues that you would have because the, it's already connected to the grid and you, know, you kind of get to skip a couple steps. But I think that's a, a big benefit of utilizing um, existing infrastructure and repurposing it for uh, for newer uh, cleaner purposes. Thank you for that. I said one thing I wanted to add. In addition to the brownfield bonus, there's also an energy justice bonus. So there's an extra credit if you are working or building things in low income communities. There's an adder there as well as tribal communities. I think that's really helpful. And then to your financing point, for some of those tax credits, there's a direct pay, which wasn't true before. So you don't necessarily have to have that tax burden if you are a state county or something like that, you can also get the direct payment of that tax credit, which I think is also very, very helpful in terms of distributing that money to a wider group of people. Thank you. <clears throat> um, one other question I wanted to kind of follow on to that is how can we prioritize some of these communities of color in terms of being pri prioritized and what is a realistic implementation, implementation timeline? I think, I think it's incumbent on those of us um, who can set these kinds of priorities to identify the opportunities. I think in many cases there are um, use cases like remote communities where um, these technologies are cost beneficial today, right? If your source of electricity was delivered diesel fuel, right, then in many cases renewables plus storage is cost effective, cheaper than your current source of electricity. Now, and so we need to identify those high value business cases immediately because many, many things can be done today. Um, as the price of uh, energy storage and renewables for the matter come, continues to come down, that expands the cost of business cases and we need to have um, comprehensive outreach efforts to make sure people understand their options um, um, when the solutions are available. And uh, definitely the Inflation Reduction Act, um, uh, for the first time, energy storage does have a similar tax credit to uh, what solar has. And uh, as part of that, there are requirements for a apprenticeship program uh, in order to be able to uh, get the full benefit. 
And so, um, at least with that, uh, I believe it's 12% of all um, money spent on labor needs to be on apprentices. And uh, that starts in uh, 2023. And so, um, you know, there will be angles that will happen pretty quick. Um, and then getting through rulemaking on everything else and through um, you know, IRS consideration, uh, that, that'll probably take a few more years. I think we'll also see more states um, enacting initiatives like Justice Party in the coming years um, to help direct that money uh, to where it really needs to get to. Um, and I, th I think we're going to start seeing that um, in the coming year. I agree. So I agree. I think the Justice Board initiative could have a lot of impact in terms of federal governments making a dedicated effort to direct the benefits of their investments into uh, communities that have kind of been left behind. I think we're going to start seeing those impacts as these as the bipartisan infrastructure law and inflation reduction that kind of expand, I think that also do a lot to kind of jumpstart and prioritize some of these communities. <clears throat> so for our next question, kind of taking a transition. So as a trend, utilities have been scaling up and increasing their battery storage capacity instead of the alternative, which is investing in new power plants. What are some of the positive benefits of energy storage from a climate perspective? So Energy storage is great because it is the complementary resource. I know we're talking energy storage as the focus of this panel, but it, it's not a solo thing. You need it with something. So energy storage is great in that it extends the, daytime, the daylight hours of a solar plant. It extends the nighttime <coughs> wind parts, um, wind flow. You can tell that I'm a solar person, not a wind person. Um, so it's great in that respect, in that it actually can help make renewables a lot more um, reliable and a lot more um, predictable. Another thing is that you can also look at them as transmission assets, which is completely different than how you approach other resources. And I think from that respect, you are um, extending the life of transmission systems that you know, need to be rebuilt by you know replacing a transmission asset with a storage asset. And from that, you can also reduce the cost, hurry along things, and then in speed up the transition. I think um, storage, is, storage is the friend that never goes anywhere by themselves, right? They always have a bunch of friends with them, and um, it helps enable that friend group to have a better time. Sorry, I took that, I took that analogy a little too far. Um, but you know, it, it's also scalable. It, it it can go in your house. It can go in a in a commercial building. But it can also be built. You know, many hundred megawatt size for utility scale. Um, and so it's very flexible in that way. And it's also carbon, relatively carbon neutral. In that you know, if it's storing solar energy, that solar energy is still zero carbon. If it's storing something else, then it, it doesn't add carbon to that. So it, um, it really is that enabler that um, you know, allows the grid to be more flexible, allows more uh, resources like solar and wind to, to be able to put on the grid. I also don't, also don't want to um, bring about the resilience benefits, right? So if you have um, a neighborhood, for example, that may have been served by a historically unreliable feeder, right? So then instead of waiting five years for an upgrade to improve the reliability of the transmission line or distribution line, you can deploy storage much more quickly to improve the reliability of that service. And that applies for everything else, like um, any kind of disturbance, whether it's tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes, and fires. I think that's a key point. Thank you for that. I guess my question to follow up on that is, and will increase battery storage use ultimately lower the cost of energy for everyone, including those in underserved communities? Yes. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I know New York really well, and uh, in New York, um, you know, about 20% of the overall capacity in the state, um, they are peakers uh, close into New York City that uh, run less than 5% of the time. And so, uh, you know, New York uh, citizens are paying for uh, that capacity to be on reserve uh, for that two, two to five percent of the time of the year that it's actually needed, and so uh, being able to take that offline and uh, you know, use a new technology that um, you know is able to be utilized much more um, ultimately will will reduce costs, and so uh, um, it won't be immediate. Uh, people. 
people start to see their bills, but um, over the longer run, uh, definitely will. Yeah, and to, I mean, just to build off of, of Jeff's comment, you know, uh, especially battery storage is on its way down the cost curve, and so um, we're going to see additional reductions in costs that are relative to um, beaker plants that, you know, in most cases, they're natural gas, and so you see a high variability in the price of that because of the variability in the price of natural gas. And so you're gonna, you, you're likely to see more and more benefits as years go on um, as we build more storage. And then, you know, I do want to jump in with an actual answer. Um, so one of the things that um, Jeff and Greg are mentioning about the cost going down. So for those of you familiar with the PJM markets, um, every three years they need to file basically their capacity cost curve. And this last year they filed it and as a price point, they need to use a resource to determine what's going to be the cost of new entry. They have been using in the past gas generators, combined cycle. There was big talk in all of the supporting documentation for that filing that this might be the last time that we see that. And then in three years, the cost, the capacity markets in PJM will be based on storage as the capacity resource. So, you know, as those costs are coming down, as they enable cheaper energy to come online, we are going to see capacity costs decrease and flow through to the consumers. Well, that's very cool. I didn't know that. That's a great actual filing over there. That's so helpful. So I guess it's people will be interested in continuing to deploy storage, what are some of the risks communities should consider in looking to implement energy storage solutions? Yeah, it is uh, still a new technology. And, um, you know, I worked in wind 20 years ago when that was a new technology. And uh, at that point, um, you know, a lot of the supply chain wasn't fully done yet. Um, asset management wasn't particularly good. Operations weren't particularly good. Uh, you know, things uh, tended to work uh, not as well as uh, what was predicted in the models. And so, um, you know, it'll just be a continuous process as efficiencies get better all across and supply chains uh, start to collapse. But, um, you know, again, going back to New York, and sorry, I normally have other states that I'm fond of too. But, um, you know, they, they have really stringent fire requirements, um, you know, that are based on uh, the FDNY in New York City. And uh, seeing those requirements getting adopted everywhere, um, you know, whether you're a local permitting, state permitting, uh, what have you, uh, just to you know, mitigate as many risks as possible on the safety side, um, that's going to continue to be pretty key. Yeah, I wonder if you could indulge me with a if I could tell a, a little bit of an anecdote on, on risk you know, deployment. Um, so like everyone here, I have a mom. Um, like hopefully everyone here, um, my mom means everything to me and my brother. One of the things she is not, however, is a car mechanic. So a few months ago, I was, was visiting her in California. She, English is in her first language, just like, Eric, I need an appointment for a tune up. I'm like, mom, I don't think your car needs new spark plugs. Do you mean an oil change? Said, yes, make me an appointment for an oil change. I want to go to the dealer. Nope. Well, I don't recommend going to the dealer for an oil change, but if it makes you feel better, I'll do it. So she goes to the dealer for an oil change, and she walks out of there with a bill for over $1,000 in repairs. So apologies to, if you're in that line of work. No, don't mean to denigrate it at all. But I, I wonder about people like her who are on, um, I think one of the big risks is, is making sure everyone is equipped to make these decisions in a way that's most beneficial to them. I, I think, it, to Eric's point, I mean, I just moved into a house um, from an apartment and I've been trying to buy solar and storage and it's been an incredibly difficult journey. Um, and. I'm the director of an energy program, <laughs> you know, and I'm having trouble figuring out, like, you know, what is what, and, you know, why this thing that looks like the same thing as this thing is costing, you know, um, I think for the average American, it's going to, you know, we, we need to figure out a way to build uh, some resources that they can go to that are easily accessible that, um, you know, I think I remember seeing a stat when I was an episode that said people think about their 
uh, electricity 18 minutes a year or something like that. It's like 12 minutes, one minute every month when they pay their bill, and then you know when the power goes out, that you know one or two times. Um, and people don't, I don't think people want to think about it that much. And so build, building those resources so it's easy to figure out, um, you know, what uh, individual, what a community, uh, you know, should be doing or, you know, what value it brings to them is going to be really important. Thing. And I think that's a great point. I think the education piece to making sure that consumers can answer those kind of questions and the information you present is at a consumer level, not overly technical so people can understand what they need. I think that's a... So I'll transition here to focus a bit more on the um, technology itself. So as the entire economy is beginning to electrify and try to carbonize, could we potentially use electric vehicle charging stations as a demand response tool in order to expand grid security and resilience? That actually is kind of the fundamental basis of for, for quarter 22-22. It's looking at how do we use um, these distributed resources, a solar panel on a house, a storage panel in, or a storage battery in a house or um, a building, and looking at how do we aggregate all of these together in order to create a product that's actually going to have an impact on the markets themselves. And so I think um, that that really is the case. Like you know, it can be looking at the different ways, different technologies, and then having an avenue to the market itself. I agree. I think in, um, most utilities are, um, if they don't already have a time of use pilot or program in place to incentivize off peak charging of EVs, they should. Um, they're probably already in filings. <laughs> it's, it's, it's you know a win-win for the consumer and the utility. Um, it's going to see something else. Uh, I think the key will be to make it as transparent or as easy as possible for the end user. To Greg's point, like right now, I'm on a pretty dumb time of use rate, and I have to manually. You know, set my timer for my for my charging. Um, it would be great if I could just set this once and like not think about it. Um, yeah, and, and I think as more fleets are electrified, that'll build an even bigger base that we can um, utilize for balancing the grid. I mean, I think there's other smart technologies out there, like smart thermostats that I think we saw this summer in California um, with the heat wave. Uh, you know. Nest was able to turn down thermostats automatically and kind of uh, shade the peak uh, to, to keep from uh, blackouts. And so I think the, the more technologies we have like this, the, more, the better the ability we're going to have to be able to, to utilize them. I'm going to follow on that. So do you think it's more likely that we will first see fleets and maybe school buses used their batteries versus like multiple homes kind of distributed and drawn together? Which of those do you think is more likely to take off first? Oh, I, um, school buses, it's already in transition. Um, a lot of utilities have programs because it looks really good when you're, you know, su supplying your local school district with some electric buses. Dominion. <laughs> so um, it's, it's already in place and it's being used as a way to save significant funds for those districts. Yeah, there's so many cool things that are happening with uh, transportation. Um, Electrification, and so uh, just on the commercial and industrial side, uh, you know, pretty much all of the really big companies are at least experimenting with uh, electric vans at this point for deliveries. Um, all the major rental car companies are uh, you know, doing pilots now uh, in order to be able to electrify their rental car fleets. Um, there's all sorts of really wonky, nuanced challenges uh, where on distribution lines, it's uh, often very hard to do. 100 level 3 chargers, super fast charging at the same time. And so uh, there's definitely going to be all sorts of really interesting uh, you know, new areas um, for innovation on this side. And uh, you know, this is somewhere that uh, utilities are definitely taking the lead on, and uh, it's, it's been great to watch. I think um, the school bus uh, scenario is a really exciting one. We have a K-12 climate action program in Aspen, and um, we've really focused on that as one of the major out short-term outcomes for school districts. Um, and we're working with a number of them um, with World Resources Institute to, um, to help figure out how to, how to uh, make that pencil out. That's exciting. Um, so how can solar technology be a complement to energy storage? 
Look at the solar, solar lady. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think um, it, it's just they, they feed into each other. So basically solar is going to charge the storage facilities when you don't actually need the capacity from the solar, you know, during the daytime when it's excess and people aren't really in a place where the storage is being used or the solar is being used. So it's a great opportunity to charge those assets and then be able to reduce their impact on the grid, which reduces their costs and reduces the cost for everyone. Kind of tag on to totally focus on strengthening the grid. How does that solar plus storage um, help with increasing resilience? Uh, I, I want to use an example. So um, if you think back to Hurricane Ida, I believe it was in New Orleans and southern Louisiana, you look at the communities that actually stayed online. Uh, one of the best examples was a low-income housing um, community where they had a solar bus storage. They kept their power. If you look at what's going on in Puerto Rico, basically every time there is a hurricane because we need to fix how we treat Puerto Rico, um, the communities that stay online are the solar plus storage. That is resiliency right there because they don't have to rely on rebuilding the distribution lines that get knocked down because some of these communities have above ground as opposed to below ground and it gets them online faster and gets them back to their normal life faster. Yeah, there, was, there was a great example in Florida um, during the hurricane I think it was like two months ago where this one community's power stayed on because they built solar storage and you know it was pretty resilient and um, everyone else around them lost power for days and days and so I think we're going to start seeing more and more communities um, you know, building that combo using microgrid technologies um, and individuals. It's you know having solar and storage on your house is um, is a energy independence kind of thing, right? You can you can have power and all your neighbors might be out because they don't have that. Um, but how we work that into communities that where people don't live in single family houses is you know is a is a big barrier and that's something that we need to do a lot more policy on. Agreed, agreed. So kind of in that same vein of thinking, so how does storage help communities of colors address a lot of the pre existing energy barriers? Like we know that traditionally a lot of thermal power plants have been built in these communities, how can we use storage to kind of address those pre existing barriers? So well, repowering is, you know, one obvious example. So as Jeff mentioned, many of these thermal plants are nearing the end of their uh, expected um, useful life. And so reusing the electrical connections for on-site storage preserves the electrical reliability benefits of that plant without any of the on-site uh, particulate uh, emissions. Um, and so that's that's a, a very good large-scale use case of, um, of um, addressing historical inequities. <laughs> I, I work on the large scale project, so um, you know the thermal repowering. Uh, it's where um, you know we see uh, the most immediate impact. Um, we're currently working uh, in Maryland to uh, put a battery on a coal plant that's currently being retired. Um, you know, my team we've overlaid uh, you know, census data with uh, emissions data, and uh, whenever you look at um, the uh, medical impacts of living next to a thermal generation station, um, they're, they're appalling. And so um, you know, it's, it's going to uh, really help uh, with uh, repowering the thermal plants and putting on batteries instead, um, you know, just from a medical perspective, first and foremost. Um, and then uh, you know, it still keeps the property taxes and still keeps local jobs. And I think in addition to repowering, um, if you look at other communities where there maybe isn't a thermal plant in the area, it's just um, nothing there, you need to look at the barriers of costs. And I think this is a community by community thing, looking at what is the home ownership structure there? What do the homes physically look like? What do the roofs look like? And you know, a lot of this takes a lot of upfront investment. Like um, Greg was mentioning, talking about installing solar panels. I can go one step further. I got told by a solar company I need to spend an additional $2,000 to upgrade my own panel, uh, electricity panel. That is a huge investment. you know. And so overcoming, looking at the communities and looking at how do we overcome the actual upfront cost barrier. 
So following along with that, we were talking about pre-existing energy bears. What new options does energy storage create to help achieve energy equity markets? What are the new things out there that kind of move forward? What opportunities does it create for those kind of communities? Yeah, I think um, a, a lot of uh, what is in the Inflation Reduction Act, um, you know, it's the first time that a federal tax credit has um, you know, really been focused on uh, environmental justice and uh, on creating opportunities for uh, you know, a much broader part of the population. And so um, I really do think uh, the IRA is going to uh, uh, definitely be helping. And, um, you know, I know that there's been a lot of conversation at the state level, at the federal level, um, you know, among companies on uh, how do we speed this up. And um, uh, you know, that will continue to be a lot of dialogue on that, but um, there's there's really interesting stuff coming out. As well. Chart your own energy future. Um, and in the second phase, a small subset of them will uh, actually get funds to, actually, to deploy. And one of these uh, communities is named Together New Orleans, and they're interested in um, building these lighthouses throughout New Orleans as resilient centers um, where people can gather and which will and which would continue to have power in the event of any kind of natural disaster or other disturbance. Um, I think one, what's really exciting um, about what storage opens up is that um, it gives the, these kinds of organizations um, the ability to pack a lot of um, electrical capability into a small footprint, like into something that they can control on their own property line. Um, and that can, um, you know, save a lot of um, time in permitting if they control uh, everything that they're, um, where, where they would like to make improvements. Um, and over time, as technologies improve, um, these technologies are inherently modular, so you can swap things in and out and increase your you know, the number of days you can stay online or the number of people you can serve. And so being able to deploy something small very quickly to show that it works, get people excited, um, get a lot of buy-in, and then scale that up over time based on the trajectory of the technology, I think is, is one of the really attractive um, prospects. So kind of going from more of like a resilience center focused on maybe just one or two buildings to maybe more of like a, a microgrid. Um, kind of maybe dive a little bit deeper about how microgrids might help to serve underserved communities that tend to have lose the most power for a long period of time and things like that if an emergency happens. So I, I, um, I guess I would like to be a little more precise on the terminology. All of these systems are inherently microgrids. Like as soon as you put solar paired with battery and allow it to serve your local house or load um, independent of the grid, that's essentially a microgrid. And the, um, I think the, the, the concept of a microgrid is, uh, like Greg mentioned before, this, this allure of, of energy independence or being self-sufficient um, is also has a lot of technical validity as well. It right? gives you a lot of options, gives the grid operator options to say, okay, if I, if I know that, um, so for example, in PG&E, there are public service, sorry, public service power shutoffs or fire. Um, so they turn off the power lines to certain entire communities if that transmission line um, might cause unacceptable fire risk, um, which has been hugely um, uh, uh, disruptive to lots of entire cities in California. Um, I think the the adoption of microgrids um, in situations, especially like that, um, gives people a, a lot more options to continue critical activities. Um, even when there are, are no serious disturbances in your life. And Massachusetts has been doing this particularly well, where uh, they have uh, munis there, MLPs, that um, the state uh, made sure to partner with them and uh, put up money, uh, such that um, uh, smaller scale batteries, you know, maybe eight megawatt hours, um, you know, are paired next to a uh, fire station, uh, which is also a uh, heating community. Or, uh, whenever there are power outages, uh, just to make sure that the lights keep on and that the heat stays on. And so um, there, there's definitely been some uh, really interesting innovations um, at the state level and uh, um, that hopefully will be uh, catching on elsewhere. Similarly, you know, cooling centers in, in places that are often hit by hurricanes can double as um, uh, shelters during, you know, during hurricanes, and, and they're often built around 
um, using, utilizing storage. Um, you know, there's a number of chief heat officers um, that are starting to be appointed around the country and around the world that um, are thinking about this and how to use kind of the microgrid storage concept around these cooling centers. Um, I think the other thing is, you know, uh, around hospitals and other critical infrastructure type things, um, utilizing microgrid storage solar um, as a way to keep the power on for, you know, uh, health critical issues is going to be a really important thing over the coming years, especially as the extreme weather gets worse, uh, you know, we need to continue to ramp that up. Thank you. And our final question before we open it up to the audience, I know we've talked about the Inflation Reduction Act and Justice 40, but is there anything else that the energy industry and the federal government should be doing to ensure a just transition in implementing new storage technologies? Yeah, a lot of it um, is just reducing the barriers for people to uh, you know, make sure that a much wider range of uh, our communities actually can participate. Uh, for instance, um, when I talk with state regulators, um, you know, I tell them um, it'd be really great if uh, you know if there was uh, documents that were published on uh, all the contractors in the state that are women-owned businesses, minority-owned businesses, veteran-owned businesses. Um, just make it very, very easy so that uh, whenever we start our procurement, that uh, we can make sure that um, you know we uh, go out for bid to reflect the communities that we're working in. And so um, uh, there's there's definitely some like relatively low hanging fruit um, just to uh, you know, make it easier for for everyone to uh, do the right thing. And in addition to removing barriers, I think. Um, especially the wholesale side of the world, because that's just where I just live mentally. Um, consistency, right? So being able to actually know when you're going to get your storage facility online. And this is very, very relevant in terms of um, energy justice communities. Um, for those of you following the FERC interconnection proceeding, um, if you have not, because there are 105 comments in that docket, Go and read the comments of the tribes, looking at what is going on in the wholesale markets and then seeing um, how this lack of consistency has prevented a community. They outline very clearly what they were doing to pull themselves out of poverty, which is, you know, nuts to think about. They had a plan. They had everything in action. But the interconnection queues are so messed up that they lost all of their investment. So having consistency so you can actually plan and finance will go a very long way. So I'll, I'll uh, go back to critical minerals, which, you know, I think the access to critical minerals for a lot of the resources that we need to decarbonize are tenuous at best. And even for the ones that we mine here in the U.S., a lot of them get processed um, in China. And a lot of the other ones come from countries that don't have the best human rights records, um, you know, and we're going to be reliant on those uh, critical minerals for the next couple of decades at least. Um, but on the R&D side, you know, I got to visit the Argonne um, Battery Lab a couple years ago, several years ago now, it was before, before times. Um, and, you know, they're doing a lot of work and need to continue doing a lot of work on these new technologies um, that hopefully don't use things that are uh, so rare, like lithium and cobalt. Um, and so I think, you know, the continued R&D for uh, new things that can help enable the, the clean grid companies working with the Department of Energy and the national labs to, you know, break through the, the, the valley of death of deployment. Um, and then our ability to get those, uh, you know, build the supply chains, whether it's your home or with, you know, uh, nations that have better, better resource, uh, resources and human rights records. Thank you. And I want to open it up to the audience. If we have any questions from the audience. I've got a question. First, let me just compliment this outstanding panel. Uh, we all know that, as y'all have said, that Again, let me just say, outstanding panel, great information. Uh, you've illustrated that energy storage is essential for evolving markets. But isn't there a gap? Let me just try to 
characterize this gap that I see. Operating, performance, and costs are critical elements in any market. But there's no centralized platform for the collection, the analysis of energy storage. So should we begin to focus our efforts on trying to develop that? If it's so essential to uh, evolving clean energy markets, if it's so essential to integrating renewable technologies, if it's so essential to electric transportation, should we be trying to track and monitor and understand the costs and operating performance of energy storage? Yes, I agree completely. Uh, on the wholesale level, um, NERC runs two things that I think are best in class tracking. They're, they're the transmission availability data system and the generator availability data system. Right. And so if you have, if you run a power plant, if you run a transmission system, if you have any kind of um, forced or unforced outage or there was like a manufacturing defect and it caused an outage, like you are supposed to report that automatically to NERC. Right? And one of the things I heard anecdotally was um, it allowed them to pinpoint a manufacturing defect in a certain transformer manufacturer because there were like similar faults from three different utilities across the country, right? So, but for that kind of data system, you could not have like, made those connections. Um, DOE is starting something a little bit earlier in the R&D stage, not quite um, uh, at the deployment stage like, like CADs and GADs. It's called the Rapid Operational Validation Initiative. And it is designed to help give um, people who would buy companies, people who would buy energy storage systems, the confidence that something that's only been in development for like five years will actually run for 10 or 15 or whatever your PPA contract life will be. Um, we're still in the early stages of that, but I think it's efforts like these and working with industry um, that will help validate that new technologies will actually do what the companies say they will do and then will be operational for long enough that it's beneficial for the user. Yeah, I very much agree. Most of the uh, independent system operators don't do a good job of uh, transparency and publishing, and uh, definitely want to see more of that. Um, the one that does do it really well is ERCOT, surprisingly, where um, every uh, they, every month they do a 60-day look back where they show exactly how every battery in the market uh, uh, participated in the market. And so, um, you know, you can compare yourself against your peers, but um, Definitely agree that every independent system operator needs to uh, have much more transparency. Thank you for that question. Any other? There's a group of gentlemen in upstate New York who serve as personal coaches to people when they are trying to, at the homeowner level, make these decisions. One of them is a current high school science teacher. And what they have shown is that they create the peer-to-peer -peer advice and counsel um, that people need. Like, so your mom doesn't have to rely on you, but can um, call someone else when you're busy. And they stay with them through the life cycle of their making a decision. And what he says is that they'll call them initially for which electric vehicle should I um, buy, but then it goes down to, well, what should I put on my house? And I just, I think that that's a model that we should be investing in um, at the state and municipal <coughs> level around the country. Hi, good morning. Great discussion. My name is Kenesha Lawrence with Duke Energy. Um, one of the things that you've talked about is energy storage being foundational to you know, move it as where we need to go in this uh, increasingly um, cleaner generation. And I know we've touched on barriers, and Melissa, I like what you shared around cost. We talked about the cost of the investment. But in some communities and some of the very things we're talking about, the structural challenges that are there are also, you know, will prevent these customers from participating um, you know, in solar investment or other investments that would enable um, the energy storage. So my question for you is, how do you see private and public sector, along with government, coming up with comprehensive solutions that regardless if you're doing an energy storage first at a place, somebody else is doing so, or somebody else is doing the investment that meets these customers where they are to give them the very benefit that we talked about. 
So when I look at the problem or the the issue of decarbonization, it is everything, right? We can't just look at the utility industry. We have to look at transportation. We have to look at all this stuff and buildings. And so, you know, with these communities, it is in, in meeting them where they are. It's you know what is the structural challenge, and literally, it's a structural one at times. And so, you need to have some sort of programs that would encourage um, weatherization. I think is a nice way of framing it. Um, home updates to ensure that the actual structures on which these facilities are being placed are sound and will withstand the um, addition of the energy storage and the solar facility um, for a long time to come so that these communities can actually take advantage of these things. I know from a federal government perspective, one thing that we're doing with the funding from the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, there's a lot of funding out there. But we're also trying to put together a very accessible doc and say what things you can pair together. So this community looking to do energy storage and solar, and that might be two different programs, but how can you pull those two programs together? What does it look like to apply to those? You know, simple things that kind of reduce barriers. I think that's also really important. And we've also been stressing when that money goes to states or counties, really focusing on those counties and states to work together to say, well, if this county got money and the state got money, like, what could you be doing together to kind of maximize the impact? We've really been pushing that as well. So I want to just touch on what Jeff had mentioned earlier about the tax credits and the Inflation Reduction Act, right? So if you qualify for every provision, so that includes domestic sourcing of content, it includes apprenticeships, includes prevailing wages to the workers who install the systems and deploying it in an energy community, then a standalone storage project could be eligible for up to 50% tax credit, right? So that's very significant. And the, I think even more significant than the amount of the tax credits is the timeline, right? These tax credits will be in effect until 2032, at least, if not longer, right? So there is time to build up these uh, you know, support institutions to help communities determine how, how best to not just build something new, but you know, access all these benefits that are now available to them. Hi. Um, great, great panel. Um, my question is the U.S. Energy Information Agency uh, just put out something just in the last couple of days uh, that said that 17 gigawatts of new natural gas fired power plants are coming online in the next couple of years. What's the impact of that going to be on the deployment of storage, if any? It's not going to create the right market in incentives. In, you know, I think that goes back to the interconnection queue backlog that I was talking about. Those projects were probably planned many years ago that they're finally coming online. But you know, we need a solution, a market solution now that encourages that investment, and that investment is not encouraged by 17 gigawatts of natural gas. I mean, I would say even if there are 17 gigawatts of natural gas, and you know, Enro just put out a study, we look at four different scenarios of how we might meet our climate goals by 2035. And in each of those scenarios, even with the, you know, the rollout of increased gas, you still need energy storage. Mm -hmm. There's going to be such a large deployment of solar and wind, just because they are one of the cheapest resources, you need the storage to match that for the resilience and for the flexibility. So even, in, even in scenarios where things are more constrained and costs were higher and you weren't able to clear the interconnection queue, you still had to have the storage there to meet up, because there's still going to be a lot of wind and solar that comes along in, in the, between now and 2035. Thank you for that question, though. Morning, Anna. Again, yes, thank you for such a wonderful, informative panel. Uh, my question is basically right now, while we're in the developmental phases of and the proliferation stages of solar and um, battery storage or storage, energy storage, my concern is how recyclable is the emerging technology coming? And the reason I ask this is because. Um, in recent years, uh, most of the technology has been maybe considered not very recyclable or difficult or costly to recycle. And as we're coming to the end of life of maybe the first wave of solar panels uh, being deployed, and um, I'm sure this also goes for our energy storage, we know that a lot of landfills are typically located near um, impoverished neighborhoods or 
neighborhoods that are typically um, a majority of people of color. And so as we grow in deployment for our solar panel or solar industry, uh, even uh, other distributed energy resources, how best can we prevent the end of life uh, materials being, you know, dumped in our yards or in our backyards and contaminating our soils? I'll, I'll start with a, a couple things that DOE is doing. So first, um, the lowest impact action um, is reuse, not, um, not disposal. So many of these technologies don't fail like, like a switch, right? They degrade over time. So for example, your uh, EV batteries may not hold enough charge for you to go on a long road trip, but they can be repurposed in uh, stationary applications. And DOE just awarded, um, I think, four or five demonstration projects for EV Second Life applications, and there's another solicitation on the street right now. Um, but then on recycling, um, that's something that requires very careful design, ideally up front. Right? Um, many of the new storage technologies that we're supporting, we have end-of-life considerations designed from the outset to make sure that the materials are cost-effectively recoverable. Um, do we also awarded um, a couple, in, in, so about a month ago there was $2.8 billion in battery manufacturing and recycling grants that were awarded. One of the companies is setting up a factory in Kentucky that can take in quote-unquote black mass from old lithium batteries. So typically you would only recover the really high value materials from a lithium battery like cobalt or copper. Um, and this new company is looking at ways to process everything else in a cost-effective manner. So we're, we're helping to find solutions to that. What's the name of that company? I don't remember off the top of my head. There's a company called ADO that's going to something. I can follow up. I just also want to add in, SIA, we do, um, we, we do recycling policy. We're looking into that. This is a very important um, aspect of our work as we're coming into the end of life for some of these panels. And so um, there's quite a number of um, fact sheets on our website. If you want to check them out, that would be really interesting and, you know, see how the industry is actually examining this issue. Hi, everyone. My name is Shelby Green. I'm with the Energy and Policy Institute. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about barriers, especially in the market. Um, so I just have a question about what happens when utilities themselves are the barrier for customers to get access to reliable and affordable energy, especially when utilities are trying to maintain their uh, profit share, their market share, and also the, their captive audience. And I'm also curious about, um, in your perspective work, how you have identified those barriers and try to work directly with customers or consumers to um, to maintain access or independence. And um, especially when I think about just black communities not having access to resources, sometimes it is these institutions or these utilities or governments that are um, maintaining these barriers to maintain their profit margins. Yeah, um, in New York, uh they have really good programs for non wireless alternatives where you know, if you're a utility and uh, you need to upgrade um, a community, um, you get an automatic rate recovery on uh, whatever you know, dollars you spend out. And uh, New York is now forcing those utilities to actually go out to the market and just say, okay, instead of doing an $80 million upgrade on this distribution line, uh, you, know, you only need two hours of load reduction in the summer you do it with other resources. And uh, they can still own it, but the cost recovery will only be on that 10 million rather than on the 80 million. And so um, at least in uh, the areas that I work in, um, there's now being a lot of focus by the public utility commissions and the public service commissions um, in order to uh, really speed that up. Um, as far as the other uh, areas on uh, working with utilities, um, I'm I wouldn't say with utilities on my end. <laughs> um, I 
I think, um, so CEO, we represent the independent power producers. We are not utilities. Um, that's one of the main. So um, it, it's keeping vigilant, keeping, um, keeping pressure on, and for communities that don't necessarily have the resources, I think it is important on nonprofits, on non governmental organizations to help and be that voice. And especially in terms of when you're doing a very technical thing, being the technical voice that can put that pressure on them. And um, this is my, my personal opinion, um, but I, um, I think there's a case to be made to the utilities that um, it will be more productive and beneficial to share maybe a smaller slice of a much larger growing pie. Right? So just um, a uh, stats for your, just for scale, right? So, and if we're talking about transportation and electrification, we're essentially talking about taking all the money that used to be spent on gasoline and moving that through the electricity system, right? Gasoline, fuel, and everything else. So the last year I had stats for this, um, each year, we spend about $400 billion at the meter for electricity. We spend about a trillion dollars at the pump for liquid fuels. So if all of the EV, all our internal combustion engine cars become EVs, we're suddenly going to be pushing a trillion dollars of money into a system that currently only handles like less than half of that. And so I think the utilities um, will already have lots of opportunities for growth. Um, and hopefully that translates into more openness for, on the stationary side, for um, communities to try their own solution. Curtis Wynn with Cinco Energy over here. Um, very thought-provoking uh, panel this morning, and I appreciate all of the insight that you've given. Uh, I just want to broaden the the conversation a little bit and just talk about uh, overall capacity as utilities we typically utilize about 50 maybe in a good day or good year 60 percent of that capacity and as we think about storage coming online um, has there been any thought about how we move that percentage of utilization up to say 90 percent with the onslaught of storage coming on how do we manage our load factor to to do that with the current system that we have and just a thought on solar it does come online typically during a period when the, the utilization of that capacity is at its lowest point i'd love to hear your thoughts about how we begin to think about this on a broader scale and manage the existing investments that we already have in place which are pretty pretty large I can, talk, I can talk about one example from a transmission point of view, right? So similar to generation, um, a lot of the capacity factors for our large transmission lines are maybe 30, 40%. Um, there's a case that uh, the Office of Electricity helped to analyze. It's on National Grid in Nantucket Island, where because of low growth locally, they were looking at potentially needing to build and bury a third undersea cable from mainland Massachusetts to the island. And they did an analysis and determined that a four-hour battery plus some on-site generation uh, could defer that expense by, I don't know, what, like a decade or more. And it, it essentially increasing the capacity factor of the transmission lines already in service, shaving a few of the peak hours from, you know, peak summer when everyone's going to their, you know, going to see the sharks or, I don't know if that's the right, <laughs> that island for that. Um, and... Uh, and utilize more of the existing infrastructure. And I think that's a story that can be repeated you know, throughout many regions where you can deploy storage in six months. It might take you five or eight years to deploy new transmission. And so why not use storage and use more of your existing um, uh, capacity um, while you decide or figure out if you really need that next transmission line or next generator? Can you guys hear me? Hi. Yes, I'm uh, Robert Thomas with Southern California Edison. I just wanted to come back to a question that was asked earlier regarding uh, quote unquote utility profits and so forth like that associated with rooftop solar. Um, I think it's important that we recognize the problem for what it is. Uh, rooftop solar is a very good asset. Um, 
And my company recognizes that uh, when you look at a portfolio of energy, there, there is a need for rooftop solar. But we have to recognize that in our service territory, Edison service territory, the rooftop solar um, cost shift or, or benefit is about $1.6 billion a year. Right? So you have about 400,000 customers getting $1.6 billion. Right? Now, by contrast, you have 1.3 million low-income customers getting about $400 million in, in incentives. So, so we need to recognize that, yes, there is a place for this. Um, it's not necessarily the utilities that are receiving this extra money, but it is actually other rate payers that are paying this, this money. And so the problem that we should be working on together is how do we balance this equity among customers that are able to install solar on their roofs and those that cannot. Um, if I can respond to that one. Um, you're, you're right. This is a cost shift, and it's a cost shift to higher income customers. And I think this is a problem that getting rid of NEM isn't necessarily going to solve it. What we need to look at is getting to those structural barriers that we talked about earlier that gets more customers access to those programs. You know, having a program in place so that once they are able to access it, and we make sure that they are, in fact, able to access it, they can, they can reap those same benefits that the other customers earlier in time had been doing. And I think that is a, another aspect of that fairness that, um, you know, to look at the temporal fairness of, you know, not just benefiting the first movers here. I'm Michael Downey with Energy Futures Initiative. Uh, you all have talked a little bit about the supply of the critical metals and minerals that, that go into these different energy storage solutions. And, and something that we've been looking at is, as we look at the domestic content requirements uh, associated with the Inflation Reduction Act, as we look at the number of countries around the world who are now increasing their uh, demand for those metals and minerals as they move through their own net zero goals, uh, we're looking at ways to uh, increase domestic production of these metals and minerals uh, through the mining, through uh, processing. But we know that in the U.S. there's a pretty challenged history associated with mining. Uh, processing of these metals and minerals can, can be pretty nasty. Uh, and so wanted to see any ideas that you all have, uh, ideas for communities, for policymakers, for developers, around how to scale up this domestic production in a way that's that's responsible and meets not just our decarbonization goals, but also protects and and, uh, and lifts up those communities where some of these activities might occur. Yeah, no, that's a really great question. Um, so I think there's a lot of answers. I don't have most of them. Um, but, you know, starting with working with communities and not against communities, which has been, um, I think, a big part of the history of mining in the United States, is going to be one of the first steps in rebuilding that trust um, that's been absent for so long. I think on the processing of critical minerals, there's going to be a lot of R&D needed to clean up the, um, you know, the, the the actual processing and then what to do with the waste that's associated um, with critical mineral processing on the uh, on the mining itself. You know, a lot of these. Uh, a lot of the locations that we know of for most of the critical minerals are uh, either on public lands or they're on lands associated with tribes uh, or, or nearby. And so I think that that you know that that's that's a going to be a, a stakeholder engagement, uh, trust building kind of conversation. We are um, we don't have all the answers yet. We have um, a working group that's working on building policy recommendations that we're going to be putting out in the first part of next year. Um, and so I hope to have more of those answers soon. Um, 